again, certainly grateful for the presence of everyone here uh, this morning, and I encourage you to be taking out your Bibles, and you might want to put a marker in Acts chapter 2, as we'll be spending the vast majority of our time in that chapter uh, this, uh, this morning as we continue our series of lessons uh, on making uh, changes here in just a moment. Uh, this evening, uh, Lord willing, we'll be discussing the topic of, but my people have forgotten me. In Jeremiah chapter 18 and in verse 15, God said his people had forgotten him. And as we turn through the scriptures, there are uh, some occasions of times that, by the way we live, we either forget the Lord or we forget the things he has done for us. And so, Lord willing, this evening we'll explore that idea of, but my people have forgotten me, and look at some ways in which God's people forget him. But this morning, as we mentioned a moment ago, we're continuing our series of studies that we began a couple of weeks ago on making changes. We made the point a couple of weeks back that change is a part of life. Change is an essential part of life. We all make changes uh, in, in many ways as we grow older. As we become kid, as we go from kids to adults, we grow taller and stronger. As we, uh, as adults, as we gain more experience in the workplace, we hopefully mature and gain more wisdom. But we said that not only is change necessary in those areas of life, change is necessary in the Christian life. And change is necessary sometimes in order for one to become a Christian, as we'll see here in a moment uh, this morning. So we began a series of lessons in which we were exploring some Bible characters in which there was some change. And in these characters, there was some drastic change. And as we pointed out, perhaps our change isn't so drastic as some of these was. Perhaps we don't need to make as big a shift. Maybe we're not in deep in sin as some were. But perhaps we realize there are some smaller changes we need to make in life. And we need to understand what it is that these characters did that gave them faith or helped to strengthen the faith that they had. And what it was, the evidence given to them that caused them to be such strong servants of God. We started a couple of weeks ago by looking at Solomon. A man known as the wise man Solomon who went from being wise to he became worldly. As his heart was pulled away by his many uh, wives and concubines. But he returned to being wise later in life and understood that the most important thing is fearing God and keeping his commandments. That's what makes man whole. Last week we explored Peter and how he went from denying the Lord in the courtyard to giving his life for him. Lord willing, we'll have two studies remaining. We'll look at persecutors to per, a persecutor to the persecuted and talk about the Apostle Paul next week. One who once sought to destroy the faith was then persecuted for that faith. And then suicide to salvation, that is the Philippian jailer. Today's a little bit different than all the other studies and it's different because we're not looking at one character, we're looking at about 3,000 of them this morning. A large number of individuals who went from being crucifiers of Christ to becoming Christians. Let me tell you, that's a drastic change. From those who changed from being crucifiers to those who became Christians. What was it that led them to that change? As we've done in our other studies so far, we want to look at each of these two words that we're focused on, the crucifiers and the Christians, and then we'll talk about what it was that led to that change. Let's understand first and foremost, there were those present on the day of Pentecost who were crucifiers of Christ. Go with me to the 15th chapter of the book of Mark. We're going to come back to Acts 2, and that's where we will spend the rest of our time, the majority of our time left. But I want to understand something in Mark chapter 15 here for just a moment. In Mark chapter 15, beginning at verse 11, it reads, But the chief priest stirred up the crowd uh, to have him release for them Barabbas instead. And Pilate again said to them, Then what shall I do with the man you call the king of the Jews? And they cried out, Crucify him. Pilate said, Why, what evil has he done? But they shouted all the more, Crucify him. So Pilate, wishing to satisfy the crowd, released for them Barabbas, and having scourged Jesus, he delivered him to be crucified. Here's what we read in Mark chapter 15. There are those standing outside being stirred up by the chief priest who are shouting, Crucify him! Crucify him. Those wanting to put Christ to death, and we know that that's exactly what takes place in the verses that follow. In verse 15, then beginning, or verse 21, then beginning of chapter 15, 
And they compelled a passerby, Cyrene, who was coming in from the country, the father of Alexander and Rufus, to carry his cross, and they brought him to the place called Galgotha, that means place of skull. They offered him mixed wine, uh, wine mixed with myrrh, and he did not take it. And they crucified him and divided his garments, verse 24. And then as you go through the rest of the story, we know that Christ uh, gives, uh, gives his life here in the verses uh, that follow in that crucifixion. Well, what we just want to understand is there were those present who shouted, Crucify him, and then they crucified him. He was taken and crucified, and they divided his garments among them. Well, in Acts chapter 2 now, in Acts chapter 2 in our study for this morning, in the passage that uh, Sean Ray read for us a moment ago in verses 22 and 23, Peter looks at the crowd there and points out they were the ones that had crucified Christ. He said in verse 22, Men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested to you by God, with mighty works and wonders and signs that God did through him in your midst, as you yourselves know, this Jesus, delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God, you crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men. He points to them here that Jesus was put to death and you were the ones that did it. You were the ones that took and crucified him. Those present on the day of Pentecost were those who had their hand in the putting to death of our Lord. But, as with each of our characters we've studied so far and with the two remaining, that's not where the story ends. The story goes on and those that are present then become Christians. After Peter's sermon on the day of Pentecost, there were about 3,000 people who were baptized in Acts chapter 2 and in verse 41. In Acts 2 and in verse 41 it says, So those who received his word were baptized. And there were added that day about 3,000 souls. After Peter concludes, and we'll go back in a moment and we'll look at uh, what Peter said and uh, what it was that caused this change in them and some things we see in Acts chapter 2 about them. But here in, in Acts 2 and in verse 41, those that gladly received his word were baptized. Those who were baptized were added uh, that day about 3,000 souls. Or the Lord added, or, or the New King James says, those who gladly received his word were baptized and that day about 3,000 souls were added to them. Now according to Acts chapter 2 and in verse 30, 47, these that obeyed the gospel were those that were added to the church. Praising God and having favor with all people, and the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. The New King James has the, uh, the Texas Receptus in the majority text have there the word ecclesia. We're familiar with that word. It's one of the Greek words we're all familiar with. That's the word translated as church. And so... In Acts 2 and in verse 47, according to the New King James, those who were being saved are added to the church. In verse 41, they were added to them that day about 3,000. That is, those who obeyed the gospel were added to the church. And at this point, they are referred to mostly as, or they are referred to as disciples. But as we know, and as our term, as our title would indicate, that's the same as Christians. In Acts chapter 11, beginning at verse 19, that should be not verse 9, but verse 19, it talks about the work that was done in Antioch and how there were those that went there and taught and spoke to the Hellenists and they obeyed the gospel and they sent Barnabas to them and he came and encouraged them and then in verse 26 of that same text it says and when they had found him and when he had found him that is when Barnabas went to get Saul and bring him with him when he found him he brought him to Antioch for a whole year they met with the church and taught a great many people and in Antioch the disciples were first called Christians Interesting enough, uh, the term there they were called is not a term used by men, but a term that they were called by God as Christians. In Acts chapter 11 and in verse 26. So the disciples are Christians, and we know this, but uh, they are one and the same. And so those who became disciples in Acts chapter 11 were added to the church are those who are Christians. So we have crucifiers who became Christians. But let's talk about that change. 
As we've done in each of our studies previously, we want to spend most of our time here this morning and talk about that change. What was the change that made them go from being those that crucified Christ to being those who became Christians? What was the change? Well, as we've said in our other studies as well, this change was a drastic change. As we mentioned earlier, sometimes there's a drastic change needed in life and sometimes it's a rather small change. Uh, there, there are some things that are really small, easy changes. And, and, and if you change it, it's not going to make... It, you may need to change it for some reason, but it's not going to be something so drastic that you notice a big difference. Changing from those who were shouting, Crucify Him! Crucify Him! To being those who are becoming Christians. To, by the way, some of these were probably those later on that were those being dragged out by Saul of Tarsus in the prison. These are the same ones that later on they were folk, they were out and cruci- crucify him, and yet they didn't have this close knit family relationship with one another, and they take care of one another, and they endure hardships together. Some of them left homes and family to stay in this area. That's a drastic change. Why would the th- what about three thousand people all of a sudden make such a drastic change that day? Well, they made that change. Those present changed from crucifiers to Christians because, number one, they believed Jesus was raised from the dead. In fact, that's what the bulk of Peter's sermon is focused on on the day of Pentecost. In fact, that's what a bulk of a lot of your sermons in the New Testament are focused on. As we have seen in the book of Romans here recently, as we have been studying in chapters 4, 5, and 6, about his, it mentioned about his uh, saved uh, by his life, it talks about in verse 6 that as he was raised from the dead, we walk in a newness of life. Uh, chapter 1, verse 4 of Romans will point out that the resurrection proved him to be the Son of God. And so, uh, the First Corinthians chapter 15 would point out that without the resurrection, we are of all men the most to be pitied, as it gives us assurance of being raised from the dead. And as you turn through the pages of the New Testament in Acts, there are many sermons that focus on the resurrection, as Paul does in his writings. In Acts 13, we know what Psalm 2 and in verse 7, you are my son, today I have begotten you be, because Paul is talking in Acts 13 about the resurrection from the dead. It's in Acts 17 that as Paul stands there and is teaching those in Acts 17, 30, and 31, that he points out uh, that they need to repent. They got these times of ignorance. Truly, these times of ignorance, God winked out or overlooked, but now command all people everywhere to repent, because He's appointed a day in which He will judge the world in righteousness by a man He has ordained, and He has given assurance or proof of this by raising Him from the dead. A lot of sermons focus on the resurrection from the dead. Peter's on the day of Pentecost is no different. In fact, Peter's sermon is all focused on verse thirty-six that Sean read for us earlier, and we'll come to that verse here in a moment. But it's all pointing out that he was raised from the dead to lead up to this point. And so as Peter's sermon is focused on that, he points out to those present there about how, again, as we mentioned earlier, they crucified Christ. And we'll look in a moment about their reaction to the things that they heard. But he had to point out to them, listen, you've done something you should have done. You put to death Christ. But... God raised him. You put him to death, yet Christ has raised him from the dead. God raised him up, loosening the pangs of death, verse 24 through 36. Or verse 20, as he talks about all the things, uh, or him being raised from the dead, and gives an overabundance of evidence to point out that Christ was going to be raised from the dead. He was raised... Just as it says in, in, in Acts 2.24, he was raised because the pangs of death were loosed. He was raised because this is what the prophets, including David, spoke of. That God has given evidence of this in His Word. In, in, in Psalm 16, uh, For you will not abandon my soul to Hades or allow your Holy One to seek corruption. Is Verse 27 is a quotation of that text. And he points out, David pointed out that that... Christ would be raised because he's not talking about himself. God is exalted one, and it's not David. Yes, David was a man after his own heart, but David is not who he's talking about in Psalm 16. 
He pointed out that brothers I may say to you with confidence about the patriarch David that he died and was buried and his tomb is with us to this day. By the way, that's that's we infer from that. What he's saying is, go look at the tomb where Jesus was buried. It's empty. You're not going to find me. He points out in the verses that follow there, being therefore, verse 30, a prophet, knowing that God had sworn with an oath that he would set one of his descendants on the throne, he foresaw and spoke about the resurrection of the Christ. And again, we'll come back to that more in a moment about being the Christ. Verse 32, this Jesus God raised up. And of that we are all witnesses. Not only is the tomb empty, Peter says, you want evidence that Christ was raised from the dead? We here standing before you are witnesses of the fact that He was raised from the dead. Remember last week as we discussed Peter? And we talked about the change that Peter made from denying the dying. And part of his change was that he saw the resurrected Christ. And he's telling those in Acts chapter 2, I've seen Him. Being therefore exalted at the right hand of God, and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, He has poured out this which you are now seeing and hearing. What He's saying is, everything you're seeing and hearing, going back to quoting from Joel chapter 2, earlier in the chapter, is, is ultimately coming as a result of the fact that Christ was raised from the dead, and now this is the result. Is what you're saying to that. He tells him, God raised Christ. You may have crucified Him, but God has raised Him up. So why do they change on the day of Pentecost? Because as they hear that, and we'll see later on, they believe that Jesus was raised from the dead. Here's the second reason they changed. They believe Jesus is the anointed one. The Jews have been looking forward to the Messiah or Christ. In Psalm 2 and in verse 2, the kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against His anointed. And you'll hear the terms oftentimes about Messiah and Christ. You'll hear about a messianic prophecy. And those two terms are uh, synonymous. Messiah comes from the Hebrew term, meaning anointed one. Uh, and the word Christ comes from the Greek word Christos, meaning anointed one. That's just the difference in the Hebrew and the Greek term. So when we're in the Old Testament, that's why we often use the term Messiah. When we're in the New Testament, we often use the word Christ. It means the same thing. It's just the Hebrew word is where we get the word Messiah from, and the Greek word is where we get Christ from. And so they're all looking forward to this Messiah, or Christ, the anointed one. The anointed of God that Psalm chapter 2 talked about, that other passages would talk about. And here, on the day of Pentecost, as Peter is preaching to them, he points out to them, Jesus is this Christ. Look at verse 2. Verse 22, Men of Israel, hear these words, Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested to you by mighty works and wonders and signs that God did through him in your milk, as you yourselves know. Stop there for a moment. He wants to give evidence that he's the anointed one, the Christ. Look at all the miracles and the wonders and the mighty works that he did. That's evidence. Verse 23, Jesus, this Jesus delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God. Stop there for a moment. Go look at the passages about the Messiah being put to death like Psalm 22. You crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men. Again, continuing that thought of the crucifixion of Christ, as many passages would tell. And then he points out that God raised him from the dead. Again, quoting from the Old Testament to give evidence. What he's saying is, you've been looking forward to this Messiah, to the Anointed One, to Christ. He's saying, let me tell you, the evidence points to the fact that it's Jesus. He did the mighty wonders and works and signs among you. He was put to death as the Old Testament prophesied. He was raised up as the Old Testament prophesied. He is sitting at the right hand of God like the Old Testament prophesied. Verse that should be 36. Let all the house of Israel therefore know for certain that God has made Him both Lord and Christ. This Jesus whom you crucified. But Peter said to them there in verse 36, is you want to 
you look at all the evidence and let me tell you, you can know for certain that Jesus is the anointed one. He is the Christ. And it's that realization that leads them to obeying the gospel. It's that realization that leads them in verse 37 to say, Men and brethren, what shall we do? It was after Peter told them that he is both Lord and Christ. Why did the people change here on the day of Pentecost? Well, they changed because they believed Jesus was raised from the dead. They changed because they believed Jesus is the anointed one. Number three, they changed because they were cut to the heart. They were convicted of their sins. After Peter's sermon is presented, after he gives all the evidence, <coughs> excuse me, after he gives all the evidence there, as he comes in verse 36 as we just saw, and said that therefore let all the house of Israel know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this says the people were, verse 37, cut to the heart. This is... Their conscience got through them. Their hearts were pricked. What it is is they realize at this point they've been guilty of sin. Remember going all the way back to verse 22 through 24. That you have taken and put to death Jesus by all his hands. Well now, they're going to go on along. They think they've done nothing wrong yet. But then, as Peter gives evidence upon evidence upon evidence, about Jesus being the Christ, about the signs and wonders and works and, and the resurrection and all the things we already saw and how He's now sitting at the right hand of the throne of God and that He's the Lord in Christ, they were like, now wait a minute. We've done something wrong. We've been guilty of sin. They realize now they need to make a change. And realizing they needed to make a change, this led them to making a change. That realization is what leads to them making the change that is in the verses that follow. So why did they change? Well, they changed on the day of Pentecost because they believed Christ was raised from the dead. They believed Jesus is the anointed one. They were cut to the heart. Number four, they were willing to do whatever it took to change. They were willing to do whatever it took to change. Acts 2 is the first sermon after the resurrection of Christ being preached there to the people present. Peter's preaching, we refer to this often as the first gospel sermon. Peter refers to Acts chapter 2 in, when he talks about it in Acts 11 as the beginning. They have yet to hear what they have to do to be saved. It's not like if somebody sits here and is, quote, raised in the church and is heard, hear, believe, repent, confess, be baptized time and time and time again, and then they know, oh, here's what I need to do. But they don't know what they have to do. They've never heard it before. They're, it's not like they could have heard somebody else saying, well, you know those people over there, here's what they're teaching. When they say, what shall we do? They have no idea what Peter is about to say. Peter could tell them something very simple. He could tell them something very complicated they had to do. But when you read what they did and their attitude when they asked Peter what they needed to do, their attitude seems to be that whatever they must do, they will do. What do we need to do? What is it we need to do to make this change? And their attitude seems to be that whatever it, we have to do, that is what we're going to do. And so we'll look here in a minute when they're told to repent and be baptized. That's exactly what they do. There, there's many other words that Peter exhorts them, and we don't know what all they said there besides the repent and be baptized, but whatever he told them, they were willing to do. At least about 3,000 of them. It, when they sat here, they realized they were in sin as we already saw, and they needed to make a change, and it didn't matter what it took, that change had to be made. There's a lesson we all can learn from that. And their attitude. Sometimes, we look at change as being something too great and we need to realize like those on Pentecost sometimes a change has to be made no matter what the change requires. Why is it they changed from crucifiers to Christians? Well, they believed Christ was raised from the dead. They believed Jesus is the anointed one. They were cut to the heart. They were willing to do whatever it took to change. Number five, they realized salvation is an individual matter. They said, what shall we do? And Peter told them repent and be baptized and we'll talk about that again in a second. But he then told him in verse 20, 
or verse 4, four rather, chapter 2, verse 40. And with many other words he bore witness and continued to exhort them, saying, some translations say, be saved. It's in the active, as the ESV translates it. Save yourselves. Paul pointed out in Philippians, work out your own salvation. What Peter pointed out to them is salvation is an individual matter. Those present had to obey individually. Let me tell you, we often look at this, and, and about 3,000 is, is a large number to obey the gospel. There were probably one to two million people present in Jerusalem. About 3,000 is really a small percentage of one to two million people. And as he sat there and he told them what they needed to do, and about 3,000 are saved, that had no bearing on everybody else present who did not obey. It's not like he could say, okay, you be saved and all your household is going to go to heaven so you're baptized and you're baptized and we're going to do this and they divide it up and then they could save their families. It's not like they could get in on the merits of their friends and how they lived. What he points out to them is salvation is an individual matter. No one could make the change for them. Nobody could make the change that should say for them. They couldn't, you couldn't again have one person obey the gospel and the whole family go to heaven. Then. Save yourselves. You have to make that decision, is what he's telling you. I told you what you need to do, and now you have to do it for yourself. Or in the book of Ezekiel, it's the soul that sins shall die. The Son shall not bear the iniquity of the Father, nor the Father bear the iniquity of the Son. And what we need to understand is salvation is an individual matter. It doesn't matter that we were, quote, raised in the church. It doesn't matter that our parents or our grandparents or our great-grandparents or so on and so forth were faithful Christians. Salvation is an individual matter. And they changed that day because they realized only they could make that change for themselves. This man over here couldn't have his wife obey the gospel or she couldn't have him obey the gospel and then them make the change and then be saved. They had to make it themselves and they did. Why was it the people on the day of Pentecost changed? Well, they believed Christ was raised from the dead. They believed Jesus is the anointed one. They were cut to the heart. They were willing to do whatever it took to change. They realized salvation is an individual matter and finally, they did what was commanded. They just they did what they were told. As we've already pointed out, they were cut to the heart. They were willing to do whatever it took to change. And then Peter told them in verse 38. He said, Repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. His promises to you, and to your children, and to all who are afar off, everyone whom the Lord our God calls to himself. They asked what to do, and Peter told them, you've got to repent and baptize. And we already said their attitude is, whatever it seems to be, whatever it takes, we'll do. And then Peter said, well, here's what you need to do. And they could have stood there and gone, now wait a minute, Peter, that doesn't make any sense. What is it about this water that's going to have any bearing on us going to heaven? What do you mean we have to be baptized? They could have raised all sorts of questions, all sorts of objections. But he told them what to do, and then it says in verse 40, he exhorted them with many other words, as we already pointed out. He told them to save themselves from this crooked generation. And then verse 41, So, those who received his word, or gladly received, the New King James said, were baptized. And there were added that day about 3,000 souls. And we know they had to repent with that, as Peter told them to do. We already saw they had believed that Jesus is the Christ. The evidence was abundant. And then they, were, they repented and were baptized. They make this drastic change. And the reason they made it is because at the end, not only did they have the attitude that whatever it takes we're going to do, when it came down to it, they did it. There's a saying, they, they didn't just talk the talk, they walked the walk. They didn't just say, tell us what we've got to do when they, they were told, they acted upon it. And they were added that day about 3,000 souls. 
Those who were forgiven. Those who became Christians. They were crucifiers of Christ. But now they're Christians. Having their sins forgiven. Having the hope of heaven. What led to that change? Well, they realized Jesus was raised from the dead. They realized Jesus is the Christ. They realized uh, they were guilty of sin. They were cut to the heart. They were willing to do whatever it took to change. They realized they had to do it for themselves, that salvation is an individual matter. And then when it came down to it, they did what they were commanded. And those who were crucifiers are now within Christians. And as long as they remain faithful to God until the day of their death, they'll be in heaven for all of eternity. What a drastic change they made. What a drastic change. Yeah, ask you a question this morning. Do you look at yourself and say, I need to make a change? Maybe you're not as drastic as a change as being worldly to wise or denying Christ to dying for him or crucifying him to becoming a Christian. But perhaps you realize that by the way you've lived your life, that you've lived a life that is denying Christ. You live the life that is crucifying him again. And perhaps you realize this morning that because of the way you live, you need to make a change. However drastic it may need to be, whether it's a big change or a small change. And you realize it's time to make that change because you want that hope of heaven. You want to be able to go and be with God forever. If you're here and you've not obeyed the gospel yet, but you've heard the word of God and you believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, just like those present on Pentecost did, will you not uh, repent of your sins, confess your faith in Him, and be buried in the waters of baptism? Rise and walk in that newness of life, knowing you have the hope of heaven. You have the forgiveness of sins. Maybe you're here and you've done that, but you say, somewhere along the line I've gone back to living for myself or living for the world. If it's a sin of a private nature, you can take it to God privately in prayer. But if it's a sin of a public nature, you desire the prayers of the congregation, we will gladly pray with you and for you for God to forgive you. No matter what you need is, if we can assist you in any way, would you not come forward right now? Together we stand, and as we sing.